Hello again, everyone. We are continuing our study of this most important passage in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verses 6 through 12, containing the three angels' messages. We're doing this under the heading of three angels, one message, because we believe that these constitute God's final appeal to planet Earth and that it is a message of love, though it is a warning. So in our last session, we discussed the identity of the beast, which has the mark that has to be avoided. That's what the third angel is emphasizing. And we took a look at chapter 13 of Revelation, and we found that there were a number of clues in that chapter in the first 10 verses that uh, as we study them, we can reach only one conclusion, and that is that the beast from the sea that receives its authority from pagan Rome, that becomes a worldwide religious power, that claims equality with God, which is a persecuting power that continued for 42 prophetic months or 1260 literal years and has the mystical number of 666, can refer to only one organization on earth, and that is the system or the hierarchy of the papacy. And when we say that, we always want to emphasize that this is not speaking against Catholics. God loves Catholics and people everywhere. And he has people in that church that are devout and pious, uh, God-fearing Christians. But this is an indictment against a system which Satan has used to remove or corrupt or change the Holy Word of God, the Bible, which is God's appointed medium uh, through which we learn about him and about his plan. So this becomes a very serious matter. And for that reason, the words that are found in Revelation chapter 14 are very stern and very clear. But we always want to remember that this is a message that is given in love, just as the message in, Garden, in the Garden of Eden was that warned Adam and Eve against eating the forbidden fruit. We want to emphasize again that this is not talking about a single person. This is talking about an organization, a system. No single person could fit the uh, specifications that are given in the prophecies of the Bible. So uh, I realize that these ideas conflict with most modern interpretations of who the beast is or who the Antichrist is, but we're talking about uh, our understanding based on the Word of God. What was Satan's first line of attack against uh, God's people, Adam and Eve? It was an attack against his Word. The serpent said, uh, when speaking with Eve, Yea, hath God said, or we might say today, did God really say? And with that tactic, he was able to get her to set aside the instruction of God, which contained the command of God, and through that, disobedience and tragedy came. And that very same line of, uh, of attack is being used today to undermine confidence in God's word, to change key parts of it, and the results are that people end up in deception and being unprepared for uh, the day of Jesus. And so we don't want that to happen. So the Bible gives us a stern warning, uh, but it is given in love. Now, the central issue to all this has to do with authority. What is the source of our authority? To what, to what do we look to get our information? Uh, this is kind of like the 38th parallel having to do with Korea. There's a, a line there, and on this side or on that side, it makes all the difference in the world. So what is the source of authority to which we should look? And we would submit that it is the Holy Bible, the sacred scriptures. Sola Scriptura was the cry of the Protestant reformers, and we subscribe to that. We say with respect, if you believe that the source of authority is the Koran, then be a Muslim. If it is the Vedas, then be a Hindu. If it's Sutra, then be a Buddhist. If it's the uh, Kojiki, forgive me for not pronouncing these words correctly, then practice Shintoism. If it is the Book of Mormon, then be a good Latter-day Saint. If it is the Catechism, then be a Catholic. But if your source of information is the Holy Bible, then you have to believe and obey all of what God says in his word. The papacy has corrupted, twisted, or changed the Holy Word of God. And because of that, the Bible gives us no fewer than seven different pictures of it in the Bible. Remember that Jesus said, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, let all things be confirmed. Well, what can we say then that, uh, when we find that there are no fewer than seven different portrayals of this entity in Scripture? One of them we looked at in our last session. It was Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, the beast from the sea. We studied the characteristics that are contained in those verses. What we're going to do in this session 
is take a look at six more portrayals of this entity given in the Bible. Three we're going to find are in the Old Testament, and the other three we are going to find are in the New Testament, making a total of seven altogether when combined with Revelation chapter 13. What are the three in the Old Testament? We'll lay them out briefly and then go to them one by one. In the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel chapter 7, we find that this entity is described under the uh, symbolism of a horn power. Likewise, in chapter 8 also, under the symbol of a horn power, we find the, uh, the papacy, we find Rome. And in the latter part of Daniel chapter 11, under the symbolism of the king of the north, in the last part of that chapter, we find characteristics that match up with what the rest of the Bible gives to us. In the New Testament, we have 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, describing the man of sin. We'll take a look at that. Also in 1 John chapter 4, we have the Antichrist, a term that is familiar to quite a number of people. And then finally, the seventh one is found in Revelation 17, and it is the symbol of the harlot that is used there. So we have seven different pictures to look at. We looked at one already. We're going to look at six in this session. What, we've, what we discover is that the Protestant reformers were virtually unanimous in these conclusions. They believed that all of these prophetic symbols spoke of the same entity. They believed that all of these symbols identified a system not a single person. And they all believed that they referred to the historical papacy, the Church of the Middle Ages. That was the conclusion of the reformers as they studied these scriptures. So let's go through the uh, ones that we have in the Bible. We're going to start with the horn power of Daniel 7. If you have your Bible, I invite you to open it to that chapter. We're going to take a brief look at some of the opening verses, but then we're going to spend a little more time discussing the part that pertains to the horn power and its activities. In chapter 7 of Daniel, he says that, I saw in the visions by night, behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from another. We already discovered in our last session that the sea represents multitudes, peoples, nations. So this was in a, a populated, congested area that these nations or beasts were coming up. They were different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, describing the rapidity with which this first kingdom came into power, representing Babylon. The same as the head of gold. Chapter 2 of Daniel's statue, chapter 7 of Daniel are in parallel, saying many of the same things. It had eagle's wings, and I watched till its wings were plucked off. In other words, its momentum was cut short. It was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Now, for a lion to have a man's heart uh, is not a picture of courage. For a man to have a lion's heart, yes, that's a picture of courage and valor. But for a lion to have a man's heart, that's not a good thing. So this is describing the coming of the kingdom of Babylon. It came with great rapidity. That's why the wings were there. But later on, the kingdom slowed down and declined in power. And that's why it was given a man's heart and the, the wings were removed. That was the first kingdom. The second kingdom... In verse 5, a, a, another beast, a second like a bear, was raised up on one side, had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said, arise and devour much flesh. This represents the, the kingdom, the coalition of the Medes and the Persians that uh, gained power after Babylon uh, waned and, and fell. One little thought I want to put in your mind here is take a very close look at how it describes it has three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. I'm going to come back to that phrase later in our, in our discussion. The, um, the ribs in its mouth were between its teeth. Keep that, that idea in your mind. Then in verse 6, we have the introduction of the third beast here. It's like a leopard. and It has four wings. Four wings, again, indicating how quickly this, this entity came into power. It's describing the kingdom of Greece. Alexander the Great, of course, was the prominent king that, that uh, led out in that. The beast was given four heads, and dominion was given to it. What's that talking about? Well, when Alexander died at a very really early age, even though they looked to some other uh, possibilities, including his uh, half-brother, <clears throat> it didn't work out. And so eventually the kingdom was divided among his four generals, and they split up the territory. That's the four heads of that beast. Then verse 7, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking with pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. 
It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. This is talking about the fourth kingdom then in the sequence, which represents uh, pagan or civil Rome. With its, with its iron teeth, it's, uh, uh, it's similar to the iron legs of chapter 2's statue dream. Why iron? Iron is a symbol of, uh, of, of strength and longevity. And the kingdom of Rome uh, lasted uh, some six and a half centuries, which was longer than the three other kingdoms put together. So the iron component made a lot of sense. But now we want to come to verse 8, which we want to spend a little bit more time on because it's describing the horn power that we're looking at. Verse 8, I was considering the horns, the ten horns that later became the nations of modern Europe. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. Very important words there. A little one at first that came up among them, among the ten horns, before whom three of the four first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. So let's consider the clues that are given to us in that passage. It's telling us that this entity, this horn power, was little when it came into being. But then it, uh, it rose in power and become, became great. As a matter of fact, when you get down to verse 20, it says that this, this horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke pompous words, and its appearance was greater than its fellows. So it was little at first, but then it became greater than all the others. It was a little horn, it says, and it came up among the other ten. Now, this is a, this is a clue that <clears throat> is so important, we have to spend just a minute or two on it. The time and the location when the papacy emerged, that is, coming up among them, the ten horns. The fourth beast is Rome. The ten horns represent those tribal groups that, that uh, ate away at the kingdom of Rome and brought its demise and later became the nations of modern Europe. We know historically uh, when that happened. That was in the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries A.D. and so on. So at that same time period and in that same place, place, in other words, both chronologically and geographically, is where we find this horn coming up. So what entity is it that came up at that time and in that place that became greater then the other horns that brought about the, the, the downfall of Rome. It can be only one conclusion that fits what the prophecy is talking about, and that is the historical papacy, the Church of the Middle Ages. We realize that there are some that when they talk about the <clears throat> Antichrist or the horn power, they look far back into history. They look to Antiochus Epiphanes. Who was he? Well, he was a ruler of Syria, um, and he gave the Jews a lot of trouble. But he lived in the second century B.C. Antiochus Epiphanes cannot be the horn of Daniel 7 because he doesn't fit the time or the geographical specification. This horn power, it says very clearly, came up among the ten that brought up the downfall of Rome. It has to be an entity that was in the area of Rome and was in the time period when Rome fell. And there's really only one system that matches up with that and that is the historical papacy. At the same time, we recognize that to look into the far distant future to find the fulfillment of this power would be a great mistake because the prophecy is telling us it came up when pagan Rome fell. It's as simple as that. So to look into the future for an antichrist that would be uh, the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel 7 would be a, um, a, a terrible error. It came up among the, horn, the uh, other ten horns. Now there's some other clues in, um, in this passage. It says there were three that were plucked up and it took, uh, it took their place. And it, uh, historically speaking, we recognize that there were three of those tribal groups that uh, were giving the church difficulties. And so the Vandals, north part of Africa, the Heruli, and later the Ostrogoths were three of those tribal groups that were under the authority of, uh, of Justinian's army, Belisarius the general, they were defeated and removed. So again, that, uh, the historic, historical account matches perfectly with what we find in the prophecy. Now there's another very important aspect in this eighth verse. It says, there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. That's a very significant expression there. 
In the Bible, a prophet is called a seer because he sees the visions of God. It's through that medium that God communicates with him. We don't often use the term seer. We more often speak of prophet. That, that relates to his giving the message out. But the way that he receives the message is through a visual medium. And so he was called in ancient times a seer. He was the eyes of the church. Now, in the New Testament, Paul uh, compared the church to the body of Christ. And uh, he's making the point that even as the body has different parts, fingers and, and eyes and ears, they're different, but they all work together to make the body function. Uh, in the same way, we might say, well, what are the eyes of the body in that context? And we have to say the eyes are the prophets. They are the ones who see the visions of God and communicate them to um, to the church. So what does it mean when it says that this entity has the eyes of a man? It means that they are, they are relying upon human wisdom, not divine wisdom. In other words, they are not going by the book, which is written by God through the prophets, the seers. They are going upon uh, human tradition as their, as their source of guidance. That's a very, very dangerous thing. God guides his people through the ministry of his messengers, the prophets, or the seers. They are called seers because they saw visions. They were the eyes of the body. Here's some Bible texts that relate to that. Jehoshaphat st stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. If you ignore the prophets, if you set aside the word of God, you will not prosper. In Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 10, we read, he, speaking of the Lord, he has closed your eyes, he's put blinders on you, and he's speaking of the prophets. He has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, and he has covered your heads, namely the seers. And when that happens, then the church is left in darkness, they're blinded, and they're going to stumble and fall. Proverbs 29, verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. 1 Samuel 3, 1, in the, the word of the Lord was rare in those days, that is when Eli was priest because they had strayed from the Lord so far, there was no widespread revelation. So the description that we have here, having the eyes of a man is extremely important. It's identifying a system that is relying upon human wisdom rather than the information given by God through the prophets contained in the Holy Scriptures. That's a very dangerous thing. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked by human precept. So history is being repeated here. Now we have some more clues that are given here in Daniel 7 to talk about this entity. Daniel says, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Now, we have three different descriptions of the horn in this chapter. We have the one in verse 8 that we read. And uh, then we have a second one that is given in verses 21 and 22. And then we have some more descriptive material that is given down in, in uh, verses 24 and 25. And the first description given in verse 8, it doesn't say anything about the, the horn persecuting God's people. In the second description, that is in verses 20 and, and uh, uh, 21 and 22, it mentions it. It says that the horn was making war against the saints, but doesn't mention any period of time that's connected with that. But in the third description, down in verses 24 and 25, we find that there is a time period that is given. And it says, he will speak pompous words against the Most High. That's back in verse 8 as well. He will persecute the saints of the Most High. He will intend to change times and law. We'll come upon that in a minute. And then it says the saints will be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. That is in direct correlation with what we read in Revelation chapter 13. It describes the persecutions at the hands of the church during the Middle Ages, Middle Ages against God's people. So Revelation, uh, Daniel chapter 7, the horn power is in, is in direct parallel with what we read in chapter 13 of Revelation uh, describing the beast from the sea. Here we find that it came up when pagan Rome fell, it spoke pompous words, it persecuted the saints, and it continued for the same length of period, the 1260 days of prophecy, in this case, expressed as a time, times, and half a time, or three and a half prophetic years, which is equivalent to 42 prophetic months, which makes up 1260 prophetic days, or literal years. And again, that 
uh, was initiated in the year 538 when the Ostrogoths abandoned the siege of Rome. And from that point on, the church had no hindrance in conducting its business. It lasted until 1798 AD when the Pope, Pope Pius VI, was uh, taken captive. And it, it seemed for many that, uh, that the church was done for. But then, of course, uh, it resurged after that. The other clue that is given in verse 25 there is it says that uh, it will intend to change times and law. Well, now when one kingdom takes over for another, there's always going to be changes of laws as far as human laws are concerned. But this, this horn power does something more. It uh, would speak words against the Most High, and it would attempt to change divine law. Changing human law wouldn't be a subject of, of prophecy when one kingdom takes over for another, but changing God's law? Yes, that would be something that the Bible would note. Now, here's what the church itself has to say about this. Regarding the, um, the, the place that the Pope occupies and the pompous words that the papacy speaks, it says the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. The papacy has dared to change God's sacred law. When you think of the Ten Commandments, as you look them over, you can see that there are two that uh, have more words in them than the others, by far. And if uh, the number of words gives any indication as to the importance that God places of those commandments, I know we don't want to say that one is necessarily more important than the other, they're all important, but the fact that two of them have many more words to them uh, is, is worthy of note. And that would be, of course, the second commandment, which identifies uh, uh, image worship as a sin, and the fourth commandment, which identifies God's special day, the Holy Sabbath day. So which of the Ten Commandments did the papacy attack? And we, we look and we say that it is the second and the fourth. The one that forbids the worship of images and the one that changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday were under the direct attack of the church. So in conclusion, as we look at Daniel 7 and the horn power, we see that because of the similarity of the time, the place of origin, its activities, its attitudes, we conclude, as did all the Protestant reformers, that the horn power of Daniel 7 is like the beast of Revelation 13. They both refer to the historical papacy. Let's take a quick look at the horn power of Daniel 8, number 2 in the Old Testament. And we find that there are, again, many, many similarities that uh, share with Revelation 13's depiction of the beast from the sea. Take a look at chapter 8. And we'll look at verses 9 through 12 and verse 25. Out of one of them, that would be one of, one of the four winds or one of the four directions of the compass. Out of one of them came a little horn that grew exceedingly great. Now, just to pause here, Daniel chapter 8 presents a vision similar to chapter 7, except they're beasts of sacrifice in this case. There is a ram that was great that represented Medo-Persia. There was a goat that was very great. That represented Greece. Now we have a horn power that is exceeding great, it says, and it grows toward the south, the east, and to the glorious land. Now the other entities stretched out their power on a horizontal level, if you read the prophecy. We're going to find that this one does that, but also does something else. It grew up. It, it uh, spread its power horizontally, but also in a vertical direction. It grew up to the host of heaven and cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled on them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away. The place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Going down to verse 25, it says, through his cunning, he will cause deceit to prosper under his hand. He will magnify himself in his heart and destroy many in their prosperity. He will even rise against the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human hand. Now, the horn power of Daniel 8 is a little bit different than the horn power of Daniel 7. The horn power of Daniel 8 represents Rome in both its pagan and its papal phases. Because they both came from base, basically the same territory, they're combined in one symbol, and they, they mirror each other in their activities. When pagan Rome attacked the prince of the host, Jesus, 
That means under pagan Rome's authority, Jesus was crucified. And when his sanctuary was cast down, that's referring to the temple that was destroyed by the Roman armies under Titus. But these things also uh, were mirrored in the activities of papal Rome in a spiritual sense. When they rose against the prince of the host, we find that to be fulfilled in the priesthood of the, um, of the Catholic Church that takes the place of Jesus as his role is as mediator. So in all the activities, the way that they, um, it says that he magnified himself in his heart there in verse 25, we find that there are similarities shared between the horn power in his papal phase there in, in Daniel chapter 8 and the beast from the sea in Revelation chapter 13. Likewise, when we get to the uh, 11th chapter of Daniel, we find that there are many things that are shared between these two entities. In uh, Daniel chapter 11, it's a, a blended prophecy. It, uh, it speaks about the king of the south being Egypt and the king of the north being the, the uh, Seleucids initially. But later, as you get into the prophecy, you find that the roles are changed, which is not unusual for Bible prophecy to do. In the latter part of the 11th chapter of Daniel, it is clear that it's talking about this same entity and those that rose against it. I'm reading now from Daniel 11, verse 32 and onward. Those who do wickedly against the covenant he shall corrupt, corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God will be strong and carry out great exploits. We find in this the uh, heroic activities, the courageous work of the reformers who risked their, their very lives uh, in order to proclaim the truths of God's work. And those of the people who understand will instruct many, yet for many days they will fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. This describes the horrific persecutions during the Middle Ages. And again, we don't know how many perished, but somewhere between 50 and 100 million uh, gave their lives as martyrs for Christ uh, for the sake of the truths of the Bible. Now, when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help. That is a beautiful, beautiful verse. The persecutions brought about by the church and their, the executions were, were terrible. And they are not to be minimized by any degree. And yet it's also true that this verse was fulfilled when it says, when they fall, they will be aided with a little help. God gave the reformers the ability to survive their, the, 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 um, the tragedy of their being martyred. And we learn that some of them, when they were burned at the stake, for example, sang Christian hymns, until the smoke choked their voices out. Now, how can you do that without a little help being given to you? God gave them the ability to withstand those persecutions and stand firm for him, even through the tremendous trial that was given them at the hands of the church. Verse 35, some of those of understanding will fall to refine them, to purge them, make them white until the time of the end. It is still for the appointed time. The period of persecution was to last for 1,260 days or 1,200 literal years. Now, verse 36, we find many of these similar characteristics that we've been reading in Revelation and in the other parts of Daniel. The king, the king of the north, representing the papacy in this part of the chapter, the king will do according to his own will. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and speak blasphemies against the god of gods and will prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done, and so on. So in Daniel chapter 11 also, we find that there's a picture of this entity that um, Satan would work through to um, harass God's people and undermine God's truth. We're going to switch now to the New Testament. There were three in the Old Testament, the horn of Daniel 7, the horn of Daniel 8, the king of the north of Daniel 11, the last part of that chapter. Now we're switching to the New Testament and we find that there are three more pictures of the uh, same power of Revelation chapter 13. The first that we're going to look at here in the New Testament is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So if you have your Bible, open to that chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The background of this chapter is this. Paul had ministered to the people at Thessalonica and uh, taught them the truths of uh, of God's word, but 
They had forgotten many of them. And he heard word later that uh, even the truth about the resurrection had been forgotten. So Paul wrote a letter to them. We call that 1 Thessalonians. And in that letter, he told them, he reminded them of the truth that Jesus was going to come back in glory and their beloved dead were going to be raised out of the graves. And uh, when they laid them to rest, they didn't have to do it with the expectation that they'd never be seeing them again. So Paul wrote that in 1 Thessalonians and in chapter 4 is where he uh, focuses on that beautiful promise. Now, when the people at Thessalonica got the letter, they presumed that he meant that uh, Jesus was coming back immediately. And so some of them began to quit their businesses and, and do other things that uh, uh, they would do if Jesus was coming back in the next couple of days or, or a week or two or so. And so Paul had to write them another letter. We call that 2 Thessalonians. In this letter, he's saying, it is true that Jesus is coming back. Absolutely. But there are some things that have to happen before that takes place. So I'm going to read 2 Thessalonians starting in chapter 2. And if you have that background in mind, it'll make sense to you. Now, brethren, he writes, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Some were teaching that it had already come. Verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, the coming of Jesus, will not come unless the falling away come first. The verb in the original for falling away is apostasy. Unless the apostasy, the falling away, comes first and the man of sin is revealed, who is called the son of perdition. Now notice the similarities in these descriptions now in the next couple of verses and see how it fits so perfectly with what we've uh, discovered already in the Bible. Who is this man of sin, this son of, uh, son of perdition? By the way, uh, the term son of perdition is used only one other time in the Bible. And of whom is it speaking in that context? It's speaking about Judas. Who was Judas? Judas was one of the 12. Judas was one who walked with Jesus, but he fell away. He had an apostasy. So when we're looking at this entity, we're not looking for something that is outwardly opposed to religion or outwardly opposed to Christianity. No, it is rather something that claims to be Christian, but has allowed Satan to infiltrate and bring false teachings into it. So the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, when we read those papal claims to equality with God, we find that, sad to say, it's a direct fulfillment of what Paul was prophesying here that uh, that would take place. Notice that Paul is looking for this as a future event. He says Jesus hasn't come yet, and he's not going to come until there is an apostasy, a falling away. And then that man of sin, the son of perdition, will be revealed. He will come to light. And here's what he's going to be like. He's going to exalt himself above all that is called God. He's going to sit as God in the temple of God. That is, he's going to be in the church. And he's going to uh, claim equality with God. Now Paul continues. He says, do you not know that when I was still with you, I told you these things? I mentioned them before, but you must have forgotten them. And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. Paul was a devout student of prophecy. He knew what the statue dream of Daniel 2 was about. He knew what the wild beasts of Daniel 7 was all about. And he knew that as long as pagan or civil Rome was in existence, that the next stage, which would be the horn power, what we know as the papacy, could not take place. As long as Rome was there, the next stage could not be opened. And so he says, you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. Then he says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. When pagan Rome is removed, then look for the emergence of this power that he calls the man of sin or the son of perdition. So 2 Thessalonians 2 brings to light an entity that would be outwardly Christian, but would be blasphemous and speaking the same pompous words that we read about in the other scriptures. So in his time, he would be revealed. And of course, as we've seen during the 
third, fourth, fifth, sixth centuries was when the church uh, gained power and was given authority and uh, was allowed to exercise that authority. Let's now turn our attention to the next one, which is the um, uh, one that we find in, in uh, 1 John chapter 4. That's the next edition of the uh, same prophetic pictures that we're going through one by one. In this one, we're going to find the term Antichrist. And that term uh, is uh, quite familiar to, to people today, but we suspect that possibly many people have a misunderstanding of what it really means. And we're going to take a minute to study this, uh, this word and come to a correct understanding of what it's talking about. The passage that we're looking at is in 1 John 2, uh, verses 18 and chapter 4, verse 3. This is where he uses that term. John writes, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Then he identifies what this is, what this is all about. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Back in his day, there were those that said, yes, we recognize that somebody called Jesus uh, lived on this earth, but we cannot accept the fact that that was actually God in the flesh. No, it was either a mirage or it wasn't really God or some other, some other combination, but it wasn't really Almighty God, the sovereign of the universe that has come into human flesh. They couldn't accept that. And uh, that, of course, was contrary to biblical teaching. And Paul and, and uh, John warned about it. He said, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, setting aside the truths of the Bible. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Now, John is referring to this entity. We would call it Gnosticism today. Uh, it was a branch of learning that thought that there was a, uh, a special knowledge that was held only by a few. And if you had the knowledge that you were going to be saved, uh, if you didn't have that special knowledge, then you didn't. But part of that was that they could not conceive of um, the, the pure eternal God occupying human flesh. Those just, uh, they, they couldn't put that together. And so they denied it in one form or another. And John said, that's the spirit of Antichrist. It's already at work. And that parallels with what Paul said when uh, he said, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work in its initial stage. The spirit of, of uh, the opposition to God and his truth was already at work. Paul could see it in his day. John could see it in his day. But the full manifestation of it was yet to be revealed. And that would come later. But the initial stages of it, the spirit that actuated it, was already present in John's day and in Paul's day. They both recognized it. So the, the Antichrist of 1 John denies scriptural teachings. That's the essence of what's going on. And uh, we've seen, seen that that is a, a characteristic of the papacy that is very prominent. Setting aside the Bible in place of human tradition. We've seen time and time again. In John's day, it had to do with denying the incarnation of Christ, that it was God in the flesh. Now, when we hear the term Antichrist today, there are many people that think of that as uh, referring to one single individual. Uh, and they have a whole scheme of prophecy of how this individual is going to uh, show up during the last seven-year period of tribulation and uh, uh, conduct himself in an evil way and so on. Uh, but is the term are we correct in applying it to a single person? We've seen that throughout the rest of the pictures of, that are given uh, in prophecy, uh, a single person interpretation doesn't fit the format. It doesn't meet the criteria. And we submit that with respect to this term, likewise. It's not referring to a single person. Uh, it and, and it would not be something that would be um, outwardly opposed to Christianity. This is another um, misguided interpretation that uh, pervades today, that the Antichrist is against uh, religion. But we need to look, look more carefully at the word to come to a, a correct understanding. So that's what we're going to write, do right now. The prefix anti came into the English language from one of two sources. It came in from a Latin source and it also came from a Greek source. Both, both languages have that prefix anti built into the language, but they're, but they're different one from another, and we need to understand that. Now, as we've mentioned before, the English language is composed of about 50% Latin and of about 
50% Greek. So when we see the word anti in words, um, our minds probably naturally go more toward the Latin way of looking at it, which means against or opposed to. If somebody says that they're anti-government or anti-abortion, uh, it means against. But if you have that interpretation in mind, then you would think that the term anti-Christ would be something that would be opposed to Christ or opposed to Christianity and would be outward in opposition, outwardly in opposition to Christianity. But uh, that doesn't fit with what we've seen in the scriptures. In the prophecies that we've read, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians that he sits in the temple of God. He, he purports to be on the side of Christ. So how do we understand that? Well, we have to realize that the New Testament wasn't written originally in Latin. It was originally written in Greek. And so we have to look to the Greek background of this prefix, anti, in order to come to a correct understanding of what it means. It is true that in Latin, it means against, and sometimes, depending on the context, uh, in Greek, anti can also mean against. But here's the important point. The primary meaning of anti in Greek is not against, but in place of, or instead of. I'm going to give you some scriptures uh, to back this up, because if somebody asks you this question, you want to have some Bible to be able to turn to it. We're reading now from the second chapter of Matthew, verse 22. Matthew 2, 22. This is talking about Jesus. He was born. They went down to Egypt to escape Herod's attack. Later they heard, heard that Herod died, and so they were going to come back to uh, Bethlehem. But when they learned that the one who took uh, Herod's place, his son Archelaus, who was just as bad as his dad, the angel told them instead to go up to Galilee. So Jesus was raised up in, in Nazareth rather than Bethlehem. So here's the Bible text, and we're taking a, taking a very close look at it. When he, Joseph, heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. Now, if you were to see that uh, text in its original language, you would see that where it's translated that uh, Archelaus reigned over Judea instead of, instead of, how, does that, how is that expressed in the Greek language? It is the word, I'll say it in, with an English pronunciation, anti. Now in Greek you would say anti. But anyway, Archelaus was reigning over Judea anti, anti, his father. Now does that mean in opposition to or against? No, it means in place of. And that's why the translators put that, Put that expression in there. Now we have another example in the New Testament that bears this out very clearly. Jesus said, Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. Jesus said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now what do you understand by the word for in that verse? Does it mean against? Does it mean in opposition to? Or does it mean in place of? Well, obviously, it means in place of, instead of. That's the whole substance of the gospel, isn't it? isn't it? That Jesus gave his life, he died in our place. He was our divine substitute. So the primary meaning of anti, or anti, from the Greek language, which is the language that John wrote in when he wrote the book of Revelation and the book of 1 John, it means in place of or instead of. We're going to take a look at a few other texts because... Uh, this, this is so important, we have to get this concept in our mind clearly. Remember that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek about the second century B.C. Down in Alexandria, there was a large community of believers, and so they uh, asked priests to come down from Jerusalem. Seventy priests came down. They translated the scriptures into Greek, and we call that the Septuagint because of the 70 that did that. And sometimes that's abbreviated by the letters LXX. That's a very fertile source of study to understand uh, Bible truth. And we're going to take a look at just a few verses. There are actually about 100 examples of this in the Old Testament that we could look at. But we're only going to look at a few. Here's the well-known story of Abraham who took his son up to Mount Moriah by the command of the Lord. And uh, when they got to the top, of course, he was about to raise his knife and and uh, plunge it through the heart of Isaac, but the Lord stopped him, and uh, there was another solution. So that's the context of this story. 
Genesis 22, verse 13. It says, Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. This is after the angel stopped his arm. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, when you read the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint of Genesis 22, verse 13, you will find that it says he offered it up for a burnt offering on T, anti, his son. Does that mean against or in opposition to? No, it means in place of, instead of. We read in Exodus chapter 29, verse 30, that son who becomes, who becomes priest in his place, Here's a priest that's passing on or retiring, and so his son is going to occupy that position. The son that becomes a priest in his place shall put the garments on for seven days when he enters the tabernacle of meeting and so on. So how does that read in the Greek Old Testament? The son who puts, the son who becomes priest on T, in his place, or instead of the one who had occupied that office previously before him. Here's the well-known story of... Um, King David and his son Absalom, who rebelled against him and wanted to take his life. And uh, for a while, it looked like David's army was going to be defeated by Absalom. But the, then later, the tide turned, and it looked like David's forces were going to be able to put the rebellion down. But the king gave a command. He said, deal gently with the young man. His heart was moved, even though his own son was trying to kill him. But that didn't happen. Uh, when uh, Absalom was found, his hair caught him in a tree, you remember, and the donkey went on underneath him, and there he was left dangling, caught by his hair. And uh, one of the generals of David, Joab, put an end to uh, Absalom's life by throwing darts, it says, through his heart. Well, when this news came back to David, he was greatly moved. It says the king, that is David, was deeply moved. He went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said thus, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, my son. So again, we have the phrase there, in your place. And if you read that in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, you'll find that David says, if I only had died on T, or in your place, in your stead. So as I say, there's a hundred examples in the Old Testament to verify that. There are a number in the New Testament. But it's very clear that the prefix anti or anti, as used in Scripture in the Greek language, has the primary meaning of in the place of or instead of. That is so important to understand when you study the term antichrist. Because if you have the frame of mind that that term is uh, talking about somebody that is opposed to religion, opposed to Christianity, you're going to be led astray. But if you understand it, that it's an entity that is trying, attempting to take the place of Christ, then you won't be uh, off the mark. Now, the Pope has declared himself to be the vicar of Christ. What does the term vicar mean? The, vi the word vicar comes from a Latin background that you would expect since the Church of Rome. And it means the one who is in the place of. We have words in our English language that uh, correspond to that. Uh, we have the word vicarious, which means as a substitute or being in the place of. Now, consider this. I, I mentioned uh, in a previous study that we, we were to come back to this. But consider that, that understanding uh, as we look at this claim by the papacy given by Pope Leo XIII. He says, we hold on this earth the place of God Almighty. A very short but significant claim that is. We hold on this earth the place of God Almighty. So, ponder this if you can. If you were to express this concept, the one who is in the place of Christ, in Latin that's going to be vicar of Christ. If you were going to express that concept in Greek, which was the language of the New Testament, what would that come out to be? It would be anti-Christ. Anti, the one who is in the place of, or at least purporting to be in the place of Christ. Now we have one last one that we're going to take a look at briefly here, and that is the harlot of Revelation chapter 17. We're going to find that it shares many of these same characteristics, uh, titles, behaviors, as what we've seen in the other prophetic pictures. Revelation chapter 17 
We're going to start with verse 1 here. It says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. We discussed all these things in relation to the second angel's message there in Revelation 14, 8, when it talks about Babylon has fallen because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And here we find that same description given in chapter 17. She is sitting on many waters. Uh, in that first part of the verse there, uh, she's sitting on many waters. Why? Because she is over or in control of or exercising authority over many peoples. That phrase is to be seen in parallel when it says in Revelation 13, all the world wondered after the beast and all the world worshipped the beast. Here it's saying that the harlot is sitting on many waters. It says the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. That's describing the wrong association, the illicit union. Whenever you have religious power that is supported by state power, bad things are going to happen. That's what happened with Ahab and Jezebel in Old Testament times. That's what happened when uh, the Sanhedrin was able to get Pilate to put Jesus on the cross. And that's what happened in the Middle Ages. That's what that is describing. Verse 3, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Now, uh, the, the beginning uh, parts of that, of that verse talks about the great harlot, which you would, would understand to be a, a woman, but here it makes it more specific. In the Bible, what does woman represent? Woman represents church. In chapter 12, it was a woman that was clothed in purity, standing on the sun. That was the pure, the true church. This is a woman, it's a church, but it is an impure church. It is one that has committed fornication and spiritual adultery, harlotry. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. That also is a picture of the union of church and state. A woman, a church, riding upon a beast, a civil authority. And it was full of the names of blasphemy. I take you back to chapter 13 of Revelation that we read, and it said that the beast that came from the sea had seven heads and ten horns. On its horns were ten crowns, and on its heads there was a blasphemous name. Now when we get to chapter 17, apparently the cancer of blasphemy has spread. Now it is full of the names of blasphemy. It has seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. In her hand was a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So we find that this harlot of Revelation 17 shares many of the same characteristics as what we've seen in the other pictures given in prophecy. <clears throat> she sits on many waters. That represents multi multitudes and peoples and so on. She exercises worldwide authority. And her union with, uh, with the statecraft is the fornication that it's talking about in that picture. She's a blasphemous power like we've seen many times, and a persecuting power, as we've seen many, many times. So these are the six other pictures that we've seen in, uh, in the Bible that identify this entity. Revelation 13, the beast from the sea, we studied in our last session. But now we've covered six other pictures. Daniel 7's horn started a little but became great. The horn of Daniel 8, combining pagan and papal Rome, but spotlighting papal Rome and its activities. The king of the north of the last part of Daniel chapter 11. The man of sin of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The antichrist, that is the one who purports to take the place of Christ, of 1 John chapter 2 and 1 John 4. And the harlot of Revelation 17. Why is this so critical? Why did God spend so much time on it? Well, if you're not clear as to what the beast is, then you won't know what the mark of the beast is. That's the bottom line of it. The Lord stoops to tell us about this seven different times in order that we can make absolutely sure that we know the identity of the beast so that we can know what the mark of the beast is 
which will be the subject of our next presentation. But keep in mind always that as important as it is to know about the beast, it's far more important to know the lamb. So tonight, at the close of our presentation here, I invite you to open your heart to the Lord. I invite you to give yourself to him completely, unreservedly, and let his Holy Spirit come into you and come into me and remake us, prepare us for the day when Jesus Christ will come into the sky. In our next study, we're going to take a look at the mark of the beast and the seal of God. And the questions that we're going to consider are, how do we know which of the beasts of Revelation 13 is the one that has the mark? We're going to go through some verses there very, very carefully so that we are absolutely sure we know which of the two beasts in Revelation 13 is the one that has the mark. Is this mark something that you see? Is it visible from human perspective? Do people have the mark of the beast today? What is represented by the second beast of chapter 13 in Revelation? Because there are two beasts that are brought to view in that chapter. What other passages of Scripture are there that would help us understand about the mark? And what is the seal of God? And in what way is it the counterpart of the mark? My friends, I believe that we are living in the, in the time that the Bible identify, identifies as the last days. I believe as we look about at our world today, we see that there are increasing uh, calamities that tell us that the signs are being fulfilled. I believe we see that in the social world, the things that are happening there uh, tell us that the end is near. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot. And we know what that means, and we can see around us today how that is being fulfilled. We see today that there is a consuming interest in entertainment and sports and all things that distract from studying God's Word and understanding His truth. We see in the political world that there are kingdoms that are shaky, and there's wars, and there's rumors of wars that are happening all around us that tell us that the end is near. And we see an increase in calamities of all sorts. Hurricanes, typhoons, earthquakes, floods, fires, whatever it might be, more and more taking place to tell us that the end is near. So my appeal to you as we close our session today is open your heart. Jesus says, I'm standing at the door and knocking. If anyone will open the door, I will come in and I will have a meal with you. We will fellowship. We will bond. We will join together. And if Jesus is in your heart, then he will lead you on the path of righteousness day by day, step by step. He will remake us into his image and prepare us to stand on that, on that last day. We will have to have a faith that is stronger than, that, than has ever been uh, had before by human beings. The stresses will be great, but if we have the love of Jesus and we have the faith of Jesus in our hearts, then he will see us through. And when that day comes and the clouds break, he will take us to home.